I want to talk to you about pleasing God. Now, if someone asks me, hey, Durso, how do you please God? I think, well, you know, I, I go to church. Oh, that's good. It pleases God. I read my Bible. Oh, that's not bad. I try to sing. <laughs> well, maybe it doesn't please God. I'm not sure. But, <laughs> but you know, I, I do things that I believe are religious to please God. The problem is, if I don't do any of those things with faith, then I'm not pleasing God. The writer of the book of Hebrews, who people differ on who wrote it. Some say Apollos, some say Paul. Um, some say even Cephas, but because of the Greek, it doesn't matter who. The Holy Spirit wrote it. It's in our Bibles. He wrote it to help the Christians who were being persecuted. Uh, they were going through stuff. There were people, family, friends, trying to convince them to go back to their old ways. They didn't like this new walk with Jesus. And uh, so the writer is trying to encourage them to help them understand that we, we do this walk by faith, not by feelings, not what we see, but by faith. And in Hebrews eleven six it says this, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. I mean, let that register for a moment. If I do a whole bunch of religious things and I don't do it with faith, then regardless of how sacrificial it may appear, appear to others, I'm not pleasing God. Because anyone who comes to him must, strong word, believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder who earnestly seeks him or diligently seeks him or passionately seeks him. Le le leave that up there because there's some key words like impossible, without faith. It's impossible to please him. Anyone must, rewards, earnestly. He wrote this to believers. And yet, it seems to me that I could be doing a lot of religious things um, and not be pleasing to God because I'm not doing it with faith. I'm doing it maybe out of tradition. I'm doing it maybe out of obligation, but I'm not doing it out of faith. And, and because they were tempted to go back to the old ways, the writer said, no, you, you got to live by faith. And uh, we're told that pleasing God uh, is trusting God. When I live by faith, I'm trusting God no matter what I see, what I feel, what I think, what others tell me. That's how I'm pleasing God. I'm doing it by faith, regardless of my circumstances. And some of us are going through some tough times. Not all of us, but some of us are. And Sometimes you might be going through a season where everything's good and all of a sudden, man, you hit a wall or a rough patch and, 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 and no matter what, what it is or what we're going through, we need to keep our faith in God, our trust in God, willing to obey whatever he tells us by the Holy Spirit or by the word of God. Our faith is in him. Our faith is in God's word. And without faith, we can't please him. It's impossible. That's just some strong language that's written in our book. Not by sight. Not by feelings, but by faith, by trust, by obeying. In fact, Jesus said on the night that he was betrayed, John 14, 15, three times he said it, and then 1 John recorded it years later, that if you say that you love me, you'll obey me. We demonstrate to God our love for him by trusting him, by obeying him, by, by uh, responding to his word, whether it comes from a sermon, whether it comes from you in your prayer time, whether it comes from reading your, your scriptures, whether the Holy Ghost just comes upon you and starts to direct you. In fact, it tells us in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing the word of God. You're hearing the word of God. I hope that when we all leave here, we ha will have a greater measure of faith in our lives to believe God for the impossible, for the supernatural, for the things that we can't do ourselves. It comes by hearing, which, um, and I don't want this to sound legalistic, because there are disciplines. And if you create disciplines or spiritual habits in your life, we'll be better. And one spiritual discipline or habit, I think is important for all of us, is that we need to read our Bibles every day. Oh, that sounds legalistic. I'm sorry, I, it's just good advice. Because faith comes by Hearing the word of God. When you're sitting in, 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 in your morning uh, or in your house in the morning and reading your Bible before you start the day, whatever, whatever it is, a lot or a little. Remember, God could do a lot with a little. Five loaves, two fishes, 5,000 people get fed. 
I mean, if you got more time, that's great. But spending time with God and getting his word in you. In fact, uh, I don't know what your living situation is, uh, but I can do it because of Maria uh, is upstairs and I'm usually in the basement. I read the word out loud. I want to hear it. My eyes want to see it. My ears want to hear it. And my tongue wants to flap it. Yeah. It's so important to do that. Because listen, when the devil comes, uh, he's waiting for that opportune time where you didn't spend any time with God. Remember Jesus? Uh, he came against the devil three times. With what? With the word of God. With the word of God. With the word of God. And the devil's not going to tell you when to attack. And I know tomorrow's Columbus Day, and it might be a free day and you're off. You think the devil takes off on Columbus Day? No. Listen, what just happened in Israel with Hamas? Uh, all the experts are saying it was like a sneak attack. Uh, Israel wasn't prepared. They were celebrating a Saturday holiday. And while they were celebrating, all kinds of people, uh, Hamas terrorists moved in. And, and the God so loves the world. So here's the thing about us as Christians. You know, we don't want to see anybody persecuted and shot. Uh, and and p children are being killed and adults. And it's, it's just crazy. In fact, let's do, Lord, I just even pray right now. You so love the world. You love Hamas. You love Syria. You love Israel. You love Russia. You love China. You love North Korea. You love America. You love Africa. You love everyone, Lord. That's so hard for us to even comprehend, but you do. Your word says it. For you so love the world. But right now, God, we're praying for this crisis in Israel and in Syria and Palestine. God, if, if our hearts break, how much more your heart breaks? You see it in living color. So, God, I pray you speak to the leaders and, and, and convince them that more death is not going to bring peace. It's not going to bring peace. Your word is still true. We should treat each other as we want to be treated. Love your neighbor, even love your enemy. So, God, do something. Do something really miraculous with these leaders and bring an end to this in Jesus' name. Would you say amen with me? Amen and amen. Amen. So using that as an example, and forgive me if I offended anyone, there was no heads up to Israel. The devil doesn't give you a heads up. Your defense is getting God's word in you. Give us this day our... I mean, that might mean physical food, but I don't think we, I don't think we miss out on breakfast. The daily bread I think God's speaking about is the spiritual food that we all need. The manna fell every morning for the Israelites. And when the sun would come up, it would melt. My opinion is, when the day goes on, uh, if you don't spend time with God, uh, it's going to just dissipate. So again, all that to say, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. And we would do ourselves a huge spiritual favor if we spent time in the word. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God and in order you and I to please God. It has to be faith. It's, it's impossible to please God without faith. And pleasing God is, is trusting God. Uh, I, I don't mean to sound irreverent, but we make God happy when we trust him. We make God happy when we take him for his word, even if it doesn't make any sense to us. That's what faith is all about, uh, regardless of whatever season we're in. David was being harassed with the Philistines, and that's an ongoing battle with King David and the Philistines. And he writes in the 34th uh, Psalm, the uh, eighth verse. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man or blessed is the woman who trusts in the Lord. When we obey, when we, when we demonstrate our faith, we end up being blessed by it. Uh, pleasing God is, you know, um, just not doing the things that we ordinarily do. Pleasing God is doing what he says. Trusting God in his word, even when it's difficult. I'd like to think just coming to church pleases God. I think that's part of it. But if I come to church and I don't obey God, I can't be pleasing him. Or if I come to church and, and I'm, I'm not living by faith and I'm not doing things that God is asking me and trusting him, then regardless of I could spend every day in church, I'm not pleasing him. And um, the writer was trying to help these believers understand how important it is uh, in the book of Habakkuk, but also in the book of Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. That's four times. It says that the just shall live by faith. By faith. Faith is unseen. It's an assurance that we have that if we obey God and we follow his word, God is going to work on our behalf. He is a rewarder. 
He is a reward of those that trust him, that believe in him. And that's how we please him. We live by faith. In fact, even in those difficult times, the writer referring to Habakkuk, which the Christians who were mostly Jews at that time uh, understood Habakkuk, listen to the third chapter, the 17th and 18th verse. It says this, even though the fig trees have no blossom, and even though, and even, excuse me, and there are no grapes in the vine. In other words, there's no food. Remember, this is an agricultural nation. They depended on crops and on herds. And if it doesn't blossom, it means then there's no food to, to preserve. There's no food to eat. Even though the olive crop fails or the, the fields uh, lie empty and barren, no provision, no income, because they sold their crops. Even if the flocks die in the fields and the cattle's bonds are empty. Again, no resources. Listen to what the prophet says. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my Savior. That's faith, even when things are horrible. Even when the body breaks down. Uh, today, uh, a pastor from upstate Albany uh, called us and said, look, he has a medical emergency. Could someone from our church go up there and preach? Um, so Jordan's been there before. Uh, and he said, I'll go. I mean, I, I feel terrible that Pastor Buddy has a medical emergency in his family because it happens to the best of Christians. Uh, but God makes a way. My wife is homesick. She has a sinus infection. I had to take her to, um, uh, what do you call that place? Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all that sounds like. Okay. <laughs> Not the ER, but one of those uh, urgent care. Thank you. That I heard. I urgent care. I urgent care. I can make fun of us in New, York, New Yorkers because I'm a New Yorker and my voice is terrible. But yeah, I had to take her. She's in bed with a fever and everything. And, uh, uh, and I know her heart is to be here. But sometimes things happen that are difficult. Regardless of what it is, we need to have the attitude that I will rejoice. I just don't want to sing. When the singers are here, I want to sing all the time, regardless of what we're facing. That's faith. Faith looks at the obstacles and says, God is better. That mountain's high, but God is higher, stronger. And then you read this chapter 11 where I'm quoting from, where to please God, we have to have faith and that he's a reward of those that earnestly seek him. You, you read about the men and women in that chapter and they did some incredible things, but they weren't perfect. They were ordinary, like you and me. They just had faith. Abraham, at 100 years old, the Bible says his body was dead. I don't need to explain that to you, right? He was 100 years old, his body was dead, and God promised him a child. Didn't look like that was going to happen. His wife, Sarah, was 90. Her body was dead. Both bodies were dead. Did they have a baby? Yes, because they put their faith in Jesus. And, 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 and they went through struggles, you know, they, Hagar and Ishmael and all that, and they made some mistakes. They should have never went to Egypt. They wouldn't have had Hagar if they didn't go to Egypt. You know, God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. He wants us still to have faith and believe in his word and his promises. I mean, Moses, great example of a leader. He was a murderer. Did we forget that? What about Rahab, the prostitute? Some commentators believe because a house was literally on the wall that it was a house of prostitution. Oh, well, we can't give her the mic and let her give a testimony. Why, God did. In fact, God put her in the genealogy of Jesus. Think about that. Because she had enough faith to say, listen, we heard about what you Jews have done and God splitting the Red Sea. And I know you're going to knock out Jericho. I don't want you to knock me out. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spare the, sp the, spies, the spies' lives and I'm going to trust in your Jehovah. A prostitute. Amazing. S uh, um, Samson, he was a rascal. I mean, he had no control. He's a jokester and fooling around with prostitutes. He's in chapter 11. He's in chapter 11. The heroes of faith. Rahab, Samson. Come on, David, man after God's own heart. Adultery, murder. I'm not making light of sin, please. Don't walk out of saying, oh, Pastor Joseph said it's okay to murder and have adultery. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm saying that God uses maybe what we would never use. And, and what gave them uh, the blessing of God is they put their faith in God. That's what's so amazing. 
We're, we please God when we trust him in spite of the situations. When we go to him and say, God, I, I know I don't deserve it, but I need you to help me right now. And then to think, the last words are, and he's a rewarder of those that do and you seek him. I mean, we've been talking about Peter because of Pentecost and, you know, what he did, cutting off ears and denying Christ and, and using all kinds of curse words or whatever. He, I don't know what kind of curses they had in those days, but he cursed. And God used him to preach a sermon where 3,000 people get saved 50 days later after he cursed. <laughs> it's amazing. Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, deserted the, the team. The Apostle Paul, he too was a murderer and, and arrested people. And God used him to write half the New Testament. I'm trying to encourage you guys that I know we all go through stuff and, 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 and we're believing God for the miraculous. We need to just put our faith in God and trust in God. We must, the Bible says, we must in spite of the situations. And faith is a gift. Faith is a gift. We ask God and God will give us faith. And we have faith when we believe, but we need faith, faith upon faith upon faith to live the life that we live. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you all to stand, please. Please. I want us to pray. I want to pray for you. I want us to leave here like men and women of faith, believe in God for the supernatural, the miraculous. Let's do this first, because this, this to me is always quite important. Um, just close your eyes for a moment so there's no looking around. But um, first and foremost, I want you to put your faith in Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Not just as a Savior, but as Lord. And, uh, and sometimes in a room like this, some people haven't made that decision. Or we made it some time ago, and life gets busy, life gets messy, life goes sideways at times. And I'm glad you're here or watching online. But if you were honest with yourself, you know that you are not in the place that you should be with God. I love the passage in Genesis 3, where after God put Adam and Eve in a garden of Eden, which means delight, a garden of paradise, everything tailor-made, they end up messing up. God's first creation, the first family. In the third chapter, God goes to the garden and says, Adam, where are you? God knew where Adam was. He wanted Adam to recognize he's not where he should be. And God's in the saving business. He's not in the judging business. He's not in the destroying business. Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost, not to judge.